Richard Hart here. Figured I would wish you guys a Merry Christmas. It's been a little while. It hasn't been that long. For some reason, I create content, I publish it, and then people pretend I didn't do it. You're like, hey, can I just drop like a 40-minute long audio file not very long ago? I don't get it. Did I record like a special intro from when the Highest of Stakes movie came out? Well, here we are again. Hopefully, this satisfies your guys' excellent, amazing thirst for knowledge, um, I hope. So what do we got going on? <clears throat> Let's take a look. Let's take a look at the old markets, see where we're at. Let me open up a browser here. And uh, I think gopulse.com is a pretty cool place to check out stats. All right, today Pulse is at uh, 5% up, PulseX is 5% up, Ink Tokens at 6% up, Hex is at 1.5% up. I was looking at the liquidity on these things, and uh, <clears throat> if you go to like app.pulsex.com you should download the app um, you should make sure it's current you know occasionally check the site make sure you're running the newest version i think it's 1.05 or if you want to do it the less secure way but the lazy way then you could use the hosted ipfs gateway thing the reason ipfs gateways aren't as secure as native ipfs which you can run if you install an uh, extension or use brave I hate Brave, but they do have native IPFS, so that's nice. The reason that running a gateway is less secure is because the gateway can just change what's on the site whenever they want. So if the gateway gets hacked, they can replace the site with malware, and then you're probably going to get screwed, right? So downloading the software is the best thing. And uh, the second best thing is a hosted local, you know, you have your own IPFS hash. You know that that's the software that you're running, the one you want. And then third best would be an IPFS gateway um, or, you know, a, a hosted community website. And there's a lot of a lot of them in the community. I don't know all of them off the top of my head, but a lot of people just made their own hosted front end things. Because, I mean, the front end is the front end, right? It's software. You can run it. So the community ran it so that the URL is easier to type. Or, you know, you can just download the file. The only kind of sucky thing about downloading the file is... If you, it scares you because it says, oh, are you sure you want to run this unsigned uh, software? Well, if you're in crypto for privacy and personal power and, you know, no middlemen and censorship resistance and permissionlessness, it sucks to have to ask permission from the Windows Corporation to register your company to get issued a signing thing that would then allow you to sign the software that you made. So if you don't do all that work, right, if you don't beg Microsoft or beg app stores for a signature, then you're going to get this warning that says, you know, we don't know who made the software. Well, yeah, you don't. So congrats. Anyway, so that's the only downside to downloading the software is if you're noob and you don't know that the software is actually safe. It scares you because you're like, ah, you know, run this unsigned thing. But yeah, unsigned just means the Microsoft company or whatever OS you're running didn't bless it with their magical, you know, signing ceremony key or whatever that you dox yourself for. So um, I remember back when Pulse and Pulse Chain were worth nothing, not so very long ago, 226 days ago. Well, 228 days ago, because it's day 227 now. 228 days ago, Pulse and Pulse X and the incentive token were worth nothing. And people were trading them at zero. And people got them for free. World's largest free airdrop. And you know, being that it's Christmas and people like to receive gifts, let's let's take a look and see how much this airdrop's worth. <clears throat> I think it's funny that like the market cap of the free coins given away on Pulse Chain to Ethereum token holders and tokens on the Ethereum network are actually millions and millions of dollars of free money. <laughs> but people still complain. It's amazing. There's a lot of complaining out there. It's like, wow. It's like guys holding Ethereum, right? Like Solana pumped. And then guys holding Ethereum are crying and moaning and just so sad. And you're like, guys, you know, it was $880 like a year ago. It's uh, $2,200 now. Stop crying. Like, it's, it could be, look, it could be dumping, right? It could be going to zero. Just chill. Stop, stop the crying. But you see, human beings, 
they're not actually uh, rational. They're jealous. So if if you've got a hotter girlfriend than somebody, they're mad at you. If you've got more money than somebody, they're mad at you. If you've got bigger muscles than somebody, they're mad at you. If you're younger or prettier, whatever, like it's basically a world of player haters. Now I can't lie. I feel that same emotion. I see people with more than me and doing better than me and it makes me jealous because that's what being human is, right? Like it's, it's built in the game. Jealousy is interesting. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's an effective strategy for conscious creatures, which is why you see it across different species. And it one drives you to perform better, but it also drives you to do stuff that sucks, right? Like I think vandalism is in part a, a part of jealousy. Like if you can't have something good, then everyone else can't either, that kind of crap. So <clears throat> it's not all upside. There's a, there's a fair amount of downside of jealousy. And if you know, I've, I've explained it a few times, the, the key to wealth is appreciating what you have. If you're always focused on what you don't have, you will always be unhappy. And, and, and the more you get, the more unhappy you'll be, right? So let's say you got a Ferrari and a Lamborghini. You're driving the Ferrari. Well, you're not driving a Lamborghini. Well, sad you, right? And then you got 10 cars. I'm not driving my nine other cars, you know? Um, <clears throat> so if you want to, if you truly want to be healthy, uh, if you truly want to be happy and healthy and wealthy and all that, you got to be grateful for what you got because the more you have, the more you don't have. I know it sounds weird. It's kind of like Dunning-Kruger. The more, the smarter you get, the more you realize you don't know. The dumber you are, the less you realize what you don't know. So you think you're smarter. Well, it's the same thing with money, right? The richer you get, the more you realize you don't have or you're not using. And then the worse you feel. I mean, like in general, rich people not that really happy. Usually. Um, hi. Happy with people, happy with friends, not that happy alone. So that's kind of how the tortured genius thing works. <clears throat> Did he just call himself a genius? Yeah. Yeah, I called the top on the day a couple of years ago. Hi. I called the top at 65K. Price is 43K. What's up? I like how Michael, people talk about Michael Saylor. They're like, Michael Saylor's up a billion. You're like, hold on a second, you idiots. Let me explain this to you, okay? When you enter a position, you slip the market against yourself. When you enter positions, it's, it's called slippage, right? So if you enter billions of dollars of a position, your actual exit price is a lot lower than what you think it is because it's going to slide against you on the way out. So... <laughs> A real easy way to tell how the slippage is going to get you is to buy, get in your position, right? However you're entering. I don't know if you're market buying or spreading it over time, time-weighted average pricing, dollar cost averaging, whatever. And then take your position and look at what it would be if you sold it. Right? That makes sense, right? <laughs> so people are like, oh, Michael Zara is up so much money. And you're like, yeah, and then how much, how much down would he be if he tried to exit right now? It's not, it's not when you buy billions of dollars of an illiquid thing, you're going to take, you're going to push the price up against yourself and then you're going to feel rich. But then if you're smart, which is what I just educated you guys on, you got to look at your slippage on the way out and, and you'll be like, dang, I'm actually not up. Hope, hope I can, you know, scale out or whatever. So this idea that guys that got wrecked buying the top after I called the top are somehow now to be worshiped as though they're smart is very stupid to me. I called the top at 65 K price is now 43 K. It's never gone over 65K since. I called the top on the day, miracle worker, did it for free, hi. Um, you know, and they're, what, bragging about buying the top and holding? Okay. Um, especially when you made the top by pushing it up with leverage. <laughs> what an idiot. And then you see other things like this guy, uh, I don't even know his name, Raul something. Roll Powell or Paul, I don't know, some guy with like a podcast. This guy buys the top irresponsibly long on margin, uses options for leverage. I warned him. I said, don't do it. Don't do it, bro. In his thread, telling him, don't do it. Ladies, liquors, and leverage. Don't do it. You'll get wrecked. He gets wrecked. But now he's like doing victory laps somehow. You're like, bro, what? <laughs> I called the top of these things. You guys bought the top. Stop acting like you won. You didn't win. I, I, hi, Richard Hart. Um, in case you don't know me, I own the world's largest diamond. Never seen it. Pretty funny that, but I own it. Um, what else? Performed or what did I founded founded the world's largest airdrop? Which here's some market caps for those coins. Let's go take a look at some. We've got. Uh, I'm just going to sort by liquidity here. I don't know. Should I sort by market cap? 
fully diluted value. Is that the way? Let's look at the wrapped Bitcoin. Now, why do I hate talking about PRC20s to you guys? Because any PRC20 I mention, I'm worried that you guys just buy. It worries me. I don't want you to do that. So wrapped Bitcoin has an admin key, okay? BitGo, a company in the United States, has that admin key. They could just infinitely mint as many more as they wanted and dump this thing to zero if they wanted to. Now, are they going to do that? I have no idea. Would their shareholders like it if they did that? I have no idea. Um, I don't even think they're public. They're private. Um, like, I just, in general, I like the things that I founded. I think they have good designs. I hate admin keys. I prefer not to see admin keys wherever they can be in removed and not exist. So, you know, WBTC has an admin key, therefore, I'm not really a big fan. But God darn, as far as ERC-20s and PRC-20s go, man, you're just buried in, ad in admin keys. Anyway, long story short, so, you know, there's a reason I don't talk to you about half the things on Pulse Chain or that half the PRC-20s in the world is because, you know, it, it, there's risk in them. Right? Like, so wrap Bitcoin, fully diluted value, 14 million bucks. So I think that that means is that the total supply, I'm not sure this website's measuring the total supply accurately, but let's just assume it is. The total supply times the price is 14 million bucks. So this coin that was given away for free to ERC 20 holders, wrap Bitcoin ERC 20 holders, is worth 14 million dollars out of thin air, cost you nothing, free. Here you go, enjoy, enjoy your free money. Merry Christmas. There's $14 million of value sitting here. Cool. And there's 300K of liquidity. Now, I look at, I hear this like, oh, Solana's pumping, Solana's pumping. And then I go look at Solana. And then I go sort by liquidity. And there's no liquidity on anything. And I don't get it. Now, when you have really low liquidity, it means that the price can go very high with less amounts of money. But in a Uniswap V2 automated market maker where the bid and the ask are symmetrical, and this doesn't speak to anywhere else it's traded, right? Like I'm not looking at all the other places it can trade. I'm just looking online at the, you know, what I consider to be the most trust reduced way to trade because you can't get screwed by an exchange stealing your money. You can only get screwed by contract vulnerabilities or rug pulls or, you know, bad PRC or ERC 20s that have like inflation bugs, random key, stuff like that. But it is, you, you don't have to trust as much. If an exchange gets your money, this is another thing, right? That I understand. Well, let me finish this point. There's millions and millions of dollars of free money that was given away to people. Pulse was given away for free to every Ethereum holder. A PRC20 copy was given away to every ERC20 holder. There's millions and millions of dollars of free money sitting here. And you idiots on the Ethereum network that aren't smart enough to say thank you for the free money. For some reason, you're also not smart enough to take advantage of all the lower gas costs. So if we look right now at uh, <clears throat> gopulse.com slash gas, it's 50,000 times cheaper to use Pulse Chain than Bitcoin. 50,000 times. It's 9,000, well, 8,396 currently. Let's call it 8,000 times cheaper to use Pulse Chain than to use Ethereum. Pulse Chain was designed to help get the Ethereum gas fees down. Well, guys, if you would put a little bit less of load on the Ethereum network, it wouldn't cost you $5 to send an ERC-20 or $20 to do a swap. It would cost you less than a penny. Right now, it costs less than a penny to do a swap Pulse Chain. It costs, you could do about 5,000 cents for a penny. Check the math though, 0 0.0002. That's a lot of cents, right? So Pulse Chain has operated flawlessly since launch. It was the world's largest free airdrop. There's millions of dollars of free coins there for ERC-20 holders. And we're in day 227 of flawless operation. It used to trade at zero and be worth nothing. And now, I mean, depending on how many coins you think are circulating, 
Um, let's look at the market cap. I, in general, hate market cap as a measurement for, like, anything, really. <clears throat> but here it is. The... <laughs> The market cap, if you take like the total supply of Pulse Chain times the current price per PLS, the market cap of Pulse Chain is $9 billion. $8.9 billion. The current market cap of PulseX is uh, $2.5 billion. Incentive token, $12 million. Hex, $6.7 billion just on the Pulse Chain network. Probably worth about $4 billion on the Ethereum network. That's a lot of billions, guys. So, I mean, the idea, this narrative, a, a lot of people hate me. A lot of people hate the things I've designed, which is really weird because they were all given away for free. Pulse Chain was given away for free. Pulse X was given away for free. Hex was given away for free. My advice is given away for free. This video is given away for free. You don't even know an address you could send me money at. You don't have any address of mine. Um, wow, that's a lot of free stuff for a lot of hate. And I didn't even wear any jewelry, just so you little hater guys would have an easier time for Christmas. You don't have to hate as hard. Still called the top of the day. Um, they want you to feel wrecked. Hexagons, pulse hexagons, uh, pulse guns, they want you to feel wrecked. The enemies, the scumbags of the world, they want you to feel wrecked, but you're not wrecked. Pulse chain has operated flawlessly since launch 227 days ago. It's not very long ago. Um, Hex has operated for over four years, perfectly flawlessly, while so many other things have gone to zero, stopped functioning, went bankrupt over and over and over again. Now, who promoted the bankrupt things? The same scumbags that won't say a good thing about the stuff that I designed. CoinMarketCap advertises crap that goes to zero, advertises crap that gets bankrupted, advertises crap that destroys their users, lists it all over the place. Lies about our stuff. Lies about the market cap of Pulse Chain. Lies about the market cap of Hex. Um, you know, every everybody just lies about our stuff. Really weird. Like, I guess they hate their users and hate their followers and want them to get wrecked, I guess. Uh, yeah, so, you know, Coinbase didn't list Hex. Sued by the SEC. Kraken didn't list Hex. Sued by the SEC. Binance didn't list X, sued by the SEC. Plus, paying the CFTC $1.5 billion, plus paying the DOJ $4 billion, plus waiting for sentencing after pleading guilty. <laughs> hey, wait a second. Wait a second. Hold on. All the guys that said bad things about Richard Hart, Hex, Pulse Chain, Pulse X, sent their followers to things that went bankrupt like celsius blockfi uh cred gemini lend uh, on down the list while i told you all not to pick up pennies and freight trains not to pick up pennies in front of freight trains not to risk your whole stack for seven percent not to do the opposite of why cryptocurrency was invented and take counterparty risk you know it just blew my mind. And then these same idiots are doing the same stuff. Oh, here's another funny thing. Solana, which pumped recently, is being claimed in court by the SEC to be a security in both the Kraken case and the Coinbase case. Pumped anyway. <laughs> you know? Now... <clears throat> So right now, I'm just kind of talking about market things. So one, four years of perfect flawless operation on Hex, why everyone else got wrecked. Um, called the top of the day. Never went over that price. Yay. Um, world's largest free airdrop, worth millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. Billions of dollars of market cap all over the place. Four years of perfect flawless operation on Hex. 227 days of perfect flawless operation in Pulse Chain. Uh, yeah. These things are all going very good. Now, oh yeah, and apparently getting called a security doesn't mean you can't pump because there you go, Solana pumped. Also, what I, what I think is funny, well, a few things about Solana. It used to be down all the time, um, and now it just has a lot of inflation. 
So apparently the way Solana works is that they inflate it a lot to subsidize the fees to be cheaper, which then if the guys that are getting inflation ever decide to sell it, it's going to suck. So Solana has very high inflation compared to Bitcoin. Bitcoin has very high inflation compared to Ethereum. And I think Ethereum's inflation is very similar to Pulse Chain's, but I'd have to look. There's some website that has like a counter. Because basically in Ethereum and Pulse Chain, they both use EIP-1559. And even though Pulse Chain has 25% less base inflation, so if, if the gas usage on both systems was the same, Pulse Chain would inflate 25% less. Um, but EIP-1559 introduces burning and burning increases as a result of what percentage of the block space you're using. So they target 30 million gas, and then the fees get a lot higher if you go over half of that. So they're really targeting 15 million gas of the 30 million max. And Pulse Chain inherited a lot of those parameters. So long story short, because the gas fees are so cheap on Pulse, we might not be pushing into that gas demand as hard, so we might not, burning it, not, be, might not be burning as much. So there's a chance that Pulse Chain's inflating a little bit more than Ethereum, but probably, last time I checked, still less than Bitcoin. Yay. We're talking like Bitcoin's at like 1.2% inflation and like Ethereum's negative 0.18 or something. These are very small percentages. So, but, you know, a percentage of a very large market cap is a lot of money. So when you talk about Bitcoin inflating at 1%, you know, 1% of $500 billion is what? What is that? Calc 500 billion times 1.5 over 100. Wow. That's 7.5 billion. That's a lot of money. Wow. Um, is, is Bitcoin worth 500 billion? Let's look. Uh, yep. It's 855 billion. Wow. So basically that means that the miners are getting paid billions of dollars a year to dump the price to enrich mining hardware manufacturers and electric companies and harm the environment. Hey, but most of it's renewable. Yeah, but not all of it. So there you go. Still hurting the environment. Pulse Chain solved this. Also Ethereum solved this, right? You don't need to destroy the environment or enrich electricity companies or enrich mining hardware manufacturers to maintain a consensus network, period. And funny thing about Bitcoin consensus network is it actually sucks. So uh, you guys that like Bitcoin that are watching, screw you guys and screw your bags. I'm going to educate you all. And, and half you guys sent all of your people to go get yield and things that went bankrupt. Why? Because you can't get yield online. Why? Because Bitcoin sucks. Oh, you want to get into a stable coin? You got on-chain exchange? No. Oh, wrecked. Oh, you want to, uh, you know, have high throughput? I, I think the throughput is at least four and a half times higher on Pulse Chain than Bitcoin. But also... Uh, how many times cheaper? Let's look here. Gas. 45,000 times cheaper, but it also has more features. And if you, if you just compare like a network that only does sends on Bitcoin versus another network like Pulse Chain and just pretend it was only doing sends, it'd be a lot more than 4.5. That 4.5 number is based on like the average usage and the average usage is a lot of complicated stuff like swaps and staking and unstaking and all kinds of stuff. And so if you like took the usage of the network and, and like equalized it with just sending native tokens back and forth, it would be like maybe 30 times. I can't remember. I did this math once before, like a month ago, but it's significantly more than four and a half times. So Pulse Chain versus Bitcoin, better for the environment, lower inflation, uh, better features, more secure, Never been hacked, uh, on down the list. It's a superior network. Now, what does Bitcoin have? More liquidity. Why? It's been around for 10 times longer. And it hasn't been gatekept by every possible thing, which is fine. So, you know, at some point, someone is going to, I guess there's some people in Australia already doing it, but like the best time to buy Bitcoin was when everyone thought it was a scam. The best time to buy Bitcoin was when it had the lowest liquidity. The best time when I 
when you could buy Bitcoin was when it was almost traded on no exchange anywhere. It was nearly impossible to buy. The only place you could buy it was like Mt. Gox, Magic the Gathering Online Exchange in Japan. That was the best time to buy Bitcoin. Cool. Well, Pulse Chain has some of those parameters. It's still very early. This gatekeeping that everyone's doing, it can't get any worse. It can only get better, right? Like the gates can only open. And basically, look, screw these guys, right? Hex went up 10,000 fold before staking profit uh, with the same gatekeeping trash, same garbage. So great. Now the gas fees are even cheaper because Pulse Chain exists um, for everybody, right? Like, congrats, everybody. Congrats, everybody on the Ethereum network that was enriched by the free launch of Pulse Chain for you guys. So we went over tons of free money by the Pulse Chain, the world's largest free airdrop. Me bragging about calling the top, me telling you that Sailor and all these guys that are holding billions of dollars positions that think they're in profit aren't when you consider the slippage on the exit. Um, and then macro, look, I, there's a chart. The chart shows that the economy crashes every time they pivot the rates to go lower. Why is it that way? I don't know. It's just, that's what the chart says. I think historically the reason it's that way is because they pivot because no one wants to lend anymore, which freezes up the credit markets. And so they start releasing the money and then there's a lag. And then because the credit markets are frozen, you get a recession and people have to sell, et cetera, all that. That's how it usually goes, apparently. Maybe it will go that this maybe it will go that way this time too. It's it's all like it would be great if the timing were lined up better. So it would be great if the Mt. Gox guys would have got their coins back when Bitcoin was 15k instead of 43k. Because those guys are going to sell some large portion of those Mt. Gox coin recipients, the billions of dollars worth of them are going to sell. And the same goes for the uh, trustee for the FTX bankruptcy. Those guys are going to sell. They're going to give back people cash and they're going to get that cash by dumping crypto. And then you've got other bankruptcies in the works as well. I wish these guys would just sell. I hate it when they get to sell higher instead of lower. Um, I like a clean, tight bottom that you feel good buying, you know. Oh, and also they just approved the Silk Road coin seizure sale. And who knows what they're going to do with the, uh, the coins that were seized from the Bitfinex hacker. These are all billions of dollars. You've, every one of these things I'm talking about is billions of dollars. That's a lot of billions, right? So because you can't predict when these idiots are going to do their job and make the creditors whole by doing their job and selling the gosh darn crypto, <laughs> like do your job, give the creditors their money, and then when the band-aid gets ripped off and we all go up happily. So basically, from like a timing analysis, if you're just looking at time, Bitcoin was down long enough, Ethereum was down long enough. You can go back up, the happening soon, all that crap. But if you're looking at more than time and you're looking at macroeconomics and you're looking at, you know, has Bitcoin ever existed during a deflationary environment? No, it hasn't. It's, it's only existed during times when they printed money like crazy. You know, M2 still is going down. So it's hard to predict, man. It's hard to predict. So you haven't seen a new all-time high in Bitcoin. You haven't seen a new all-time high in Ethereum. You haven't seen a new all-time high in the stock market, or at least the S&P 500. I think the Dow Jones may have made a new all-time high, um, but I don't watch the Dow Jones. So could, is this the bull market? It depends on your time frame. You know, if you bought Bitcoin at 15K, 43K probably feels good. If you bought Ethereum at 880 and now it's 2350 or 2250 or 2300, you feel good. If uh, you bought Pulse or Pulse X when they were near zero or at zero, um, yeah, you're, you're probably pretty happy with market caps in the billions. It really depends on your time frame. It's just the larger your stack gets, the more careful you have to be because you can never make it back. If, you're, if your stack gets large enough, never make it back is not the right way, but statistically, the larger your stack gets, the harder it is to make it back if you lose it. The smaller your stack is, who really, like if you're, if you get paid $20 an hour and the stack that you have at risk is 20 bucks, 
you've really got at risk an hour, right? You can make back your whole loss in an hour. But if you've got a lifetime worth of stack and it's worth, you know, billions or hundreds of millions, you really can't make a mistake. You, you cannot, it has to be on point. It has to be right. And you're going to watch a lot of gains and things that are stupid. You're, you're never going to have a shortage of people making insane gains and in illiquid things that eventually go to zero. You're never going to have a shortage of that. And you're never going to have a shortage of people buying stupid things. So, you know, what does Dogecoin do? Nothing good. It's a JPEG, basically. It's a, it's a bad network with low features that has a JPEG as its claim to fame. I'm not really into the JPEG claim to fame stuff. <laughs> I don't really like it. Now, have a lot of people made money on it? Yes. A lot of people lost money on it? Yes. I, I feel more wholesome and joyous when there's unique utility behind the thing. So let's, let's talk about, now look, will I probably eventually have some JPEG thing? Yes, probably. Why? Because why not? I could make a better JPEG thing than other people, but I'm still going to tell you I hate it. So I'll make a better JPEG thing than other people, but I'm still going to tell you I hate it. Honesty. It's what I do. Um, so Pulse Chain has higher throughput, better security, lower environmental impact to the point of nearly none, um, is a newer coin with more features, is faster than Bitcoin, but Bitcoin has an $800 billion market cap. Pulse Chain doesn't. Why? Well, it, we're new. We're on the way, right? Things... Things will get better, in my opinion. So like, oh, and for you listening, is that a forward-looking price statement? Nope, not a forward-looking price statement, not financial advice. Why do I say these things? Because there's people that want to screw me up. There's people that want to do harm to me. There's people that want to do harm to you as well. I'm going to tell you more about all that in a moment. So we've got a wonderful network. We've got wonderful features. We've got wonderful airdrop. There's, you know... You, you can you can do lending on the Pulse Chain network. There's projects that let you borrow coins. There's projects that let you, there's stable coins on Pulse Chain. There's all types of stuff people have launched on Pulse Chain. I don't know that much about it. You can look into it. Um, people are building new things on the network and launching them. It's cool. I'd love to see Fiat on ramps. I'd love it. One cool thing I saw this community do is that they made a bot or several bots. I think several teams built bots that send you free pulse if you bridge into the network. So it used to be if you bridge into the network, you also had to bridge over some pulse. So you had to like perform a swap and then do an extra bridge to bridge the pulse over to get native pulse to transact. Or you could try and get it like through a side channel, like through an exchange or something or through a friend. And that would be an ex So basically if you're doing it without the exchange or without the friend, then you would have to do an extra swap and an extra send, which on Ethereum is very expensive, you know? Like a, a, a bridge is like 12 bucks maybe. And like the swap is like 20 bucks. It's like a $32 penalty just to get native PLS. That sucks. And so what people did was they just built bots that send you free PLS if you'd bridged in and you don't already have PLS, um, which is awesome because now you save them a swap and you save them figuring out which token to swap to because of course in gatekeeping land, typing WPLS doesn't get you the, the darn token because keeping scum trash everywhere. Um, crazy. So yeah, that's awesome. And it's very cheap to do, right? Cause like it costs less than a penny to send many, 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 many times native pulse to somebody like you'd send a thousand times and it wouldn't even cost you a penny. That's awesome. That's very, very cool. So I'm glad the community built those things. I think that's going to make it a lot easier for people to, to use the bridge if they want a lot more affordable, a lot quicker. Okay, so we've covered client top of the day, slippage, liquidity, free PRC20s. Um, yes, if you have any token on Ethereum. Oh, by the way, it counts for NFTs too, right? So you bought an NFT on Ethereum. There's a copy of it here on Pulse Chain. Same code, copy. Now, did you did you sell it to somebody and then not sell them the Pulse Chain version? Interesting. So guys that sold their NFTs on Ethereum still have their Pulse Chain versions? That's interesting, right? Um, I haven't seen a market for these things. And I, and I think markets for JPEGs are 
probably very important to the JPEG holders. So I think you, you may see more. If someone makes a market for the PRC, for the Pulse Chain versions of NFTs, I think you'd see it take off because these guys are wrecked. <laughs> They're wrecked and they wouldn't mind the free money. So if you want to give these guys some free money, they probably wouldn't mind it. And having a market for them to dump into, I'm sure they'd love. And then eventually, you know, I wouldn't mind seeing PRC20, ERC20 copies. Because, I mean, look, in theory, if people dumped enough of their free PRC20s to, like, create a base, then if someone created a PRC20, um, ERC, if someone created a PRC20 copy with bridged in ERC20, which we call E ERC20, right? Like E ETH or, you know, E wrap Bitcoin or whatever. It might create that thing that was dreamt of, of like the less liquid, more volatile, but yet because they're bridged, still tied to the ERC20 price kind of thing. And now it's been what, seven months? Seven months is probably a good a good enough while to see those guys shaken out. So it would be it would be interesting to see experiments with people bridging in some ERC twenty to pair it with PRC twenty to see whether the PRC twenty market kind of follows and tracks with the ERC twenty market. Which obviously someone somewhere would have to run a bot if they wanted to profit on that arbitrage opportunity. Or if there's nobody running bots. And the two markets would just kind of exist in parallel, I guess. Because they're not directly related, right? Like the only side channel people running bots would, would relate those two things together. I think. Well, I mean, actually, they are directly related if they're in a AMM. But the AMM doesn't know the state of the other system, so they're not really directly related. So let me rephrase that. The... Bridged in ERC20 is directly related to the free PRC20 if they're both in an AMM pair. But that AMM pair's kind of like, quote, price of the bridged in ERC20 isn't directly related to anything. Because it, it doesn't know what's going on on the AMM or markets on the Ethereum chain. It doesn't know that stuff. So be, it would be an interesting experiment. I think someone should do it. It'd be cool. Um, so things I look forward to. Fiat on ramps. Someone could open bridges to other stuff. Like I think somebody opened a bridge to BSC, but I don't think it does any volume. Um, but maybe nobody knows about it. That's the thing is like, I'm, I'm so afraid to, to talk about anything without reading the audits and making sure people aren't going to get wrecked, right? Like I, I hate it when people get wrecked. So you rarely ever hear me talk about things that I don't really believe in. Um, what else? That market where you could have like the less liquid leverage position, especially after like seven months of shakeout, I think it's less risky to get just infinite dumped on by ERC-20 holders. Because, like, you saw the the Pepe guys just infinite dump. You saw Ave infinite dump on the PRC-20 side. Um, I can't remember what other coins, like, those communities were just told about, and they were like, infinite dump. You're like, well... Yeah, but now you guys are paying $30 a swap, $20 a swap, $50 a swap, depending on the rates. If you had just moved your liquidity and your community to the superior network, you'd be paying basically nothing to swap and nothing to send, and you wouldn't be paying a huge tax to on-ramp new users. You know, if it costs $50 to swap, you're paying a $50 on-ramp tax for every new user. That sucks. That sucks a lot. That's not good. You know, it's just like when, when Bitcoin was $40 to send, I tried to explain this to people, but some dum dums didn't get it. If it costs forty dollars to send Bitcoin forevermore, which I don't think it will, but let's say it did, then if someone sent you forty dollars of Bitcoin, you really have zero, because it would cost you forty to send it to the next guy, or to the exchange, or to the merchant, or to do anything with it. It would cost you forty dollars. Even if you sold your private key, 
which no one ever does usually because they don't you can't prove that you deleted your copy of it so the next guy has risk which is why blockchain ledgers with timestamping prevents double spending etc cetera, etc cetera. um if if it costs forty dollars to send bitcoin that means it costs you 80 to send 40 and then the guy receives it really has nothing because it would cost him send 40 to try and use it so you just turn 80 into zero so if it costs forty dollars to use Bitcoin, it means if you spend eighty, you have zero. Because it cost you eighty to buy eighty, but then you only received forty because the exchange is going to charge you to receive the forty, and then it's going to cost you forty to send, and so that guy receives actually zero. I mean, actually, including so it, it may be worse than I had originally explained it. It may cost one twenty to turn into zero. So let's do the math real quick. You sent $120 to the exchange. Exchanging stupid. They don't want to lose money on you. So they're going to charge you 40 to send because it costs them 40 to send. So you buy 120 from your exchange. You pay them 40 to send it to you. Now you've got 80 left. You send 40 to your friend. It costs you 40. So now your, your balance is zero and your friend received 40, but it's worth zero because you can't use it without spending 40. So now you've actually turned 120 into zero. Before in my previous example that people argued about, the, the argument was that you got 80 to zero, but in actuality, if the exchange ain't stupid and they don't lose money sending you the coins, it's really turning 120 into zero. So now you've got $120 minimum tax to on-ramp someone if they're ever going to send coins to a friend. It's untenable and stupid and not why cryptocurrency was invented. It's not supposed to be worse than the legacy system. Like this. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, uh, I think that pulse chains basically free to send so far model is pretty cool. So let's check the gas prices again. $9 to send Bitcoin, $849, dollar 20 to send ETH, 0. 0.0002 to send PLS. That's 50,000 times cheaper than Bitcoin, 7,500 times cheaper than Ethereum. Guys, the network is good. Works great. Oh, and the bridge is free too. Somebody set the bridge to zero fee so that using the bridge has no fee both directions. So if you go to bridge.pulsechain.com, there's no fees currently. In, out, either way, no fees. Now you're going to pay a fee on the Ethereum network. Nothing you can do about that. That's Ethereum's side, right? So you got a great network and you got a ton of free coins. And it's been worked flawlessly for seven months. Go make it great, guys. <laughs> you can launch stuff on it, use it, build fiat on ramps. Make a money transmitter in your state, make a licensed money transmitter in your state, and you can, you know, make the community better. Like, ah, so legal stuff. Let's talk about legal stuff. In the United States, you have something called the Constitution. The Constitution restricts the government. The Constitution's job is to restrict the government and to protect your rights. You have something called the Bill of Rights, which were amendments to the Constitution to really, really super give you a good deal and restrict the government could do because governments have such a history of screwing people over, over and over and over and over again throughout history. So what are some things in the Constitution? And these are very important things to know. And these things are so important to know that federal officers, such as Gary Gensler, the chairman of the SEC, you go on the internet and you can search Gary Gensler's confirmation hearing, and you're going to see him swear an oath to the Constitution of the United States of America to defend it against enemies, both foreign and domestic. Now, you might ask yourself, what is a domestic enemy? What is a domestic enemy of the Constitution? Hmm, I wonder. So the Constitution has something called the First Amendment. The First Amendment is freedom of speech, freedom of the press. Government shall make no law against free talking and all that stuff, right? Well... It turns out that Gary Gensler and the Securities Exchange Commission is actually doing a lot in violation of their oath. It turns out that they're violating a lot of what the Constitution is supposed to be protected from. So the Constitution says you have a right to freedom of movement, a right to freedom of association, a right to freedom of speech. There's other legal doctrines like the right to contract, um, which, you know, if you interfere with other people's contracts, that's torturous interference, and you can get sued for it. It can cost you money. You have uh, a whole bunch of rights in there. 
right? And then there's things that are like even harsher violations. So if you're going to violate people's free speech, one of the worst ways to do that is with something called prior restraint, where you don't even give them the chance to speak. Well, listen to this. Blockchain networks are communication networks. They carry speech. The first Bitcoin block carried a copy of a newspaper article. Um, blockchain networks are speech. And the software that consists of blockchain networks, the nodes, the wallets, those are just word processing assistants. They just help you format your speech in a way that other participants can understand. So when you try and interfere with the blockchain, you're interfering with communication. You're interfering with communications network. You are performing prior restraint. Your interference in these things is creating a chilling effect. You are interfering with people's association. You are interfering with people's right to contract with each other. You are interfering with specific contracts. You are doing numerous, multiple things in violation of your oath to protect the Constitution. You're doing it outside of congressional authority. You're doing it outside of your mandate. Like, so I don't understand how America became the carceral state. America has the highest rate of incarceration of any nation that's ever existed in the history of mankind. And yet you see very few lawsuits against people in the government. It just doesn't seem to match up to me. If you, if you have extremely high rates of the government putting people in prison, shouldn't you have also high rates of some of the people being put in prison kind of suing the government for violating their rights. I mean, you go around the world and you, you can't even in some countries get 20 years for murder, but in the United States, they kind of can't like time, like it's candy. You, you can get 20 years very easily for doing lots, lots of different things. Very easy to get 20 years in the United States. Um, very hard to get 20 years anywhere else. Isn't that cruel and unusual? By the way, Bill of Rights has a rule against cruel and unusual punishment. Shouldn't there be more lawsuits over this? Isn't it cruel and unusual that for things that aren't murder, you're getting what the entire rest of the world considers to be murder punishments? And, and I think, I think even in the United States, you see crimes that just you're going to get punished harder than you're going to get punished harder for nonviolent crimes and violent crimes in a lot of instances. Doesn't make any sense. Or like meta crime that doesn't even have a victim. I never. These things are like they're not. They're not healthy. They're not good. And it's how you end up with the highest rate of incarceration in the history of mankind. So do you really have the rights you're not willing to fight for? Probably not. So you got to fight for these rights. And it's just tragic because so few people have the funding or the ability to stand up to the blowback to fight for your rights. I mean, when the ex-president of the United States is having lawfare used against him so that he can't run for office, that's what they do in the third world. The, the people in power use the executive branch and the, and the police to make it so that they, no one can run against them, so they just keep winning. That's not good for democracy, guys. It's really not. <laughs> like, just, you're supposed to have free and fair elections where people are allowed to choose between different parties, and you're not supposed to, once again, uh, this is just like prior restraint. You're not supposed to, before they can run, make sure they can't run because how do you, how can you have a fair election when you, the people that you want to unelect are in control of who gets to run against them? It doesn't make sense. And then, you know, if you give the government this power that they shouldn't have, at some point you'll get a bad team in charge and that bad team will abuse that power. And so traditionally the, like the founding fathers figured it out that there should be checks and balances. You shouldn't just rely on one person being good for everything to work out. You should assume that occasionally someone's going to suck, some bad guy's going to get power, and you should have a checks and balance. So, you know, the legislative branch is supposed to write the law. The executive branch is supposed to execute it. The judicial branch is supposed to, you know, be in the middle, making sure that everything works right between the two. Right now, the administrative state, a fourth branch of government that's not supposed to exist of unelected bureaucrats, is writing all the laws, encumbering millions of people with regulations, and there's no counterplay. Your counterplay is to sue them in court and get them declared arbitrary and capricious. So 
how many times recently has the SEC been declared arbitrary and capricious? Numerous times. Numerous. So in the Ripple case, uh, the judge basically said that the SEC lawyers were not uh, performing with a faithful allegiance to the law and was changing their story based on, you know, getting whatever they wanted. The SEC just recently, uh, their, S their lawyers were lying in a case and the judge uh, caught them in the lies and said, well, now that you've been caught in these lies, explain to me why I shouldn't sanction you and fine you directly, fine the SEC lawyer that was lying to the court. And then you see all of his bosses at the SEC jump in there like, ah, oh, we're sorry, Your Honor. Uh, please don't fine us, bro. Don't sanction us, bro. We're going to retrain everybody. And so I'll, you know, I will uh, let you guys know where to find these specific documents. This, this is only a couple of days old. The SEC. <laughs> so that, then you see this guy's bosses at the SEC throwing him under the bus and throwing junior guys under the bus, if I remember correctly. Uh, you know, and then uh, talking about how they're going to retrain all their litigators and how they're getting rid of that guy and they're putting in new guys. <laughs> and you're like, hey, you know what? You wouldn't have all these problems if you didn't lie to the judge. So you don't you don't need to train your guys on how to not lie to the judge. <laughs> and this is it. This isn't the only thing, right? The SEC has lost four of their last five cases in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, Gary Gensler likes to go on television speaking outside of his capacity of the SEC. So he'll go and he'll go and interviews with people and say that he's not speaking on behalf of the SEC. Well, buddy, that means you're speaking on behalf of yourself, which means it's actionable. Okay. You are speaking on behalf of yourself and you are moving markets and you are manipulating markets. You, Gary Gensler, are manipulating markets outside of your authority at the SEC, which means you are personally responsible. You hear me hedging the heck out of my language because I don't want to catch a case. Not financial advice, do your own research, no forward-looking statements. But you, buddy, you're on record teaching at MIT saying that 75% of tokens are not securities. And then you get a job, you, you got your round trip, you got your revolving door, you got your 16 years at Goldman Sachs, but now you get to regulate Goldman Sachs. <laughs> ah, that's a good round trip you got there, buddy. You get to defend all your friends that you make all your money with. Hey, where's all your money, Gary? It's with all your friends that you're helping out by screwing the competitors, right? So in Gary's world, and, and by the way, so I would love to see Gary Kensler catch a charge for his manipulating markets with his speech outside of his capacity at the SEC. I would love to see him catch a charge for violating his oath. I'd love to see people suing him directly because he is, people don't understand when the SEC attempts to call something a security, it's like calling hugging, punching and arresting parents for beating up their kids. It is disgusting. It is a violation of due process. It is a violation of equal protection. People that speak to each other using the blockchain deserve the same rights as people that speak to each other using pens and paper, non-digitally, analog. It, they should have the same protection that people that use the mail. They should have the same protection that people that use the telephone. So there's just, there's so many things going wrong right now. Like, and it's just gonna cost millions and millions of dollars to fix it. And I think you could reduce the amount of millions spent if there was some personal responsibility. I think if people were held personally responsible for what they're doing, right? So if you're, if you're a, a guard in a jail and you violate someone's rights, you can be sued around your qualified immunity. If you decide to go outside of your authority and outside of your qualified immunity protection to make statements that damage markets, maybe you should be held personally responsible for that. Maybe you should answer the court for that. If you say things like, you know, we want to lose more cases because if you're not bringing enough cases, if you're not losing cases, you're not bringing enough, Gary Gensler's on the record saying that. Gary Gensler's on the record in Congress under oath saying that they there's a gap in the legislation where they can't regu uh, uh, regulate uh, exchanges because they're crypto exchanges, not uh, securities exchanges. And then, you know, not so long later, he goes, ah, was I lying then or was I lying now? I don't know, but my, short, my story sure has changed. Now we actually have everything we need. Just come in and register, even though there's literally, they've been sued by Coinbase via writ of mandamus. Uh, and then the SEC finally responded after delaying and delaying and said, oh yeah, actually we're not gonna make any rules. The whole rest of the world's making rules. Japan's making rules, Singapore's making rules. There's new exchange licenses, you know, XRP just got licensed as a money transmitter 
VASP, value service, whatever the heck, I don't remember, virtual asset service provider in Ireland. Coinbase just got virtual asset service provider in uh, France, I think. The whole rest of the world's figured it out, you know. <laughs> and then it, there, more bad stuff, right? Gary Gensler loses the XRP case. Now, look, it, is it him specifically? No. But I think he's on the commission of guys that has to vote for what actually gets sued, right? So I think there's like five people on the commission and you need like three of five. And if you get three of five, then they can like bring an action against somebody. I think that's how it works. I'm not an expert, I'm not a lawyer. So like three of five guys, and, and by the way, you see dissenting opinions all the time. Right. So Hester Pierce is a commissioner. She's always dissenting. She's dissented in the Stoner Cats case. She's dissented in a bunch of cases. She's going to tell you what we're doing is wrong. Like th this stuff that the SEC is doing is wrong. And she's on the board. She's in the commission. Right. She's one of the five people that gets to vote on these things. And there's another guy, I think his name's Udea, that like is commonly dissenting with her these days. Now, like, why am I telling you guys about this stuff? Because this is your, these are your rights. I don't live in the United States. I haven't lived in the United States for decades. These are your rights. These are your problems. These people are screwing you. You need to do something about it. So the, the things that I'm telling you that are obviously true, like for instance, you can't custody cryptocurrency. Like I, I'll give you an example. The IRS is trying to make some law where like anybody that could have known about a transaction now has compelled speech and has to like gather data on other people, which will be hacked and stolen by Chinese hackers and Russian hackers, but they're just idiots, right? It's just like the SEC themselves. They, in their own annual letter, declare that they can't find experts to work on crypto because they all own crypto and don't want to sell it. And so then they're not allowed to hire people that own crypto. Okay. Well, um, maybe you guys have a bad setup or maybe like stop sucking, right? Just stop sucking guys. If, if you don't have the expertise to regulate a thing, you know, it's better to do no harm first, right? Like the Hippocrates law that doctors follow, do no harm first. Yeah, like Gary Gensler was making meetings with uh, Sam Bankman Freed, his buddy, right? His Democrat, like Gary Gensler was the treasurer for Hillary Clinton's Democratic campaign for president. He's as political as you can get, I think. Here he is meeting with, uh, you know, Sam Bankman Freed, who sent tons of money to uh, Democratic, uh, what, politicians. You got, was it Maxine Waters blowing Sam Bankman Freed a kiss? Yeah, guys, good one. But you're not going to give the creditors back that money they donated, are you? FTX went bankrupt. Sam Bankman Freed stole the money. But you politicians aren't going to give back that money that uh, he gave to you that he stole, are you? No, you're not. Why? Uh, you might not be good people. <laughs> you just might not be good people. Um, now, not to say that not giving, like, there's some law that covers them so they don't have to give it back or whatever, but that's not what makes you bad. You violating people's rights is what makes you bad, right? I remember COVID. I remember you guys violating everyone's right to move, uh, violating their freedom of movement. I remember you house arresting people. I remember you guys doing that. It was disgusting. I remember you guys now, uh, you know, trying to claim that crypto is used to support Hamas and saying like 60 million, and then you go check the numbers and it's like 800K. You, what's going on here, guys? Why do you keep lying? Stop lying. Literally just stop lying. Um, yeah, so the arguments that I have that are obviously true, that cryptocurrencies are communications networks that might have Rule 210 protections for safe harbor that might have uh, protections for freedom of speech, freedom of contract, freedom of association, protection against prior restraint. These arguments aren't getting used. They're just not, which is so stupid to me. These are communications networks among peers. It couldn't be any more obvious. This is speech. We are transmitting text. We are transmitting messages. We are transmitting numbers. We are transmitting pictures. We are transmitting art. We are transmitting audio. This is a communications network amongst peers. This is speech. This is speech as speech gets. Right? So the idea that the people just aren't using these arguments is very stupid. Because if you lose a case, you can't bring up new evidence in the appeal. So you have to cover everything in your first case. So if you're leaving arguments on the table and not making them in the first case, you're not going to be able to bring them up on appeal. Huge mistake. Huge error. 
So if you guys out there that are lawyers that are submitting amicus briefs or filing motions to intervene, you need to be covering your First Amendment, Tenth Amendment, due process, equal protection, latches, waiver, Google these words if you don't know what they mean. Um, like latches and waiver basically cover you could have brought this action earlier and the defendant would have had a better job, a better ability to defend themselves, but you chose not to. And therefore, you might have waived your right to enforce. And then in other cases, I mean, we've seen crypto cases where it was even over the uh, over the statute of limitations and then they just ate a, a judgment anyway. Or like the statute of limitations was up. Like what? Why, did, why didn't you get good counsel and why didn't you argue that the statute was up? Like what? Ah, oh, crypto, crypto. It's a, it's an industry run by clowns and idiots. Clowns and idiots that won't listen. If you guys would listen to me, you wouldn't have lost money in BlockFi. You wouldn't have lost money in Celsius. You wouldn't have lost money in Gemini Earn. What a, what a fake Bitcoin maximalist, right? Look at the Winklevite twins. Yeah, you guys are real Bitcoin maximalists when you're doing the opposite and taking people's private keys from them and giving it to a counterparty and then all of you getting wrecked together. Are you, how stupid are you guys? You guys are idiots. Or, or how about this one, right? Censorship resistant network. People are putting JPEGs on the Bitcoin network and the Bitcoin people hate this. They, they killed it with counterparty and made the op return code size too small for county to party to operate way back when. Even Tether used to operate only on the Bitcoin network. So USDT used to operate on Keller coins which was on the Bitcoin network. And then they stopped doing it because the fees sucked and the features sucked. And so they moved over to primarily EVM networks now, which Ethereum was the first one. The E in EVM stands for Ethereum Virtual Machine. Um, so like Pulse Chain's an EVM network. So you have this, so, so Jack, who was at the helm of Twitter when they were helping the United States government violate your rights to freedom of speech, by the government themselves giving them lists of people to silence and deamplify and ban because they talked about COVID or Joe Biden's laptop or his son Hunter Biden's laptop full of pictures of him smoking crack and getting down with hookers. You know, and by the way, the idea that Joe Biden's kid gets a bunch of jobs in Ukraine with no qualifications and a bunch of money from China and Ukraine and then writes his dad checks and pays for dad's cell phone bill. Man, you're busted, bro. <laughs> Yo, know, in, the, in, the, in the carceral state of America, where nearly anything's a crime and nearly anything gets you 20 years, Joe Biden, I got bad news for you, buddy. It ain't looking good for you, man. Why is your kid writing you checks? And why does he have jobs in countries that we're sending billions of dollars to? What's that? <laughs> like, what? Stop. Dude, dude, no, don't. Like, oh, America, man. I left America, what, 2003, 20 years ago. I left America 20 years ago, and yet here I am spending my days doing legal research to try and make America a better place. Sucks for me, bro. Sucks for me. Left 20 years ago, didn't get any of that free helicopter money, didn't get any free money checks, didn't get any loans that I didn't pay back, any of that crap that everyone else in America apparently got. Um, yeah, but here I am. Still trying to make it a better place because my people, I care about my people. That's why I'm doing a Christmas video for you guys. And, uh, you know, that's why I, I give you so many things away for free. I care. Free book, t.me slash scivive, S-C-I-V-I-V-E. Two free books there. Uh, free coins, pulsechain.com, uh, hex.com. What else? There's so, there's so many things I like. Let me tell you how smart I am, okay? <laughs> you could have claimed Hex.com. You could have minted Hex for free during the first year. You could have minted it for free. Boy, that Richard, he's a smart guy. The Mt. Gox hacker, the Silk Road hacker, the Chinese government that took all the Bitcoin away from uh, the plus token Ponzi, that caused the pump, like, I don't even remember what year it was. None of those guys can mint free hex because there was a timer on it. You could only count it for the first 365 days. Mount Gox. Sorry, guys. You don't get 
any free hacks? <laughs> so awesome. Um, and actually, the, the Gox addresses were just removed. So even if they had made it before the timer, they were just not allowed to anyway. What a good design. What a better design. Instead of getting your head dumped on by the government. The government took the Silk Road hacker's coins. He's going to dump them on you. The government took uh, the Bitfinex hacker's coins. He's going to dump them on you. The government took uh, FTX's coins. They're going to dump them on you. You guys love giving the government your coins to dump them on you, don't you? You love it. You just can't get enough of it. <laughs> but Richard Hart designed stuff. Doesn't have this problem. Yay. Well done, Mr. Hart. Yeah. So I, I think I have a very high degree of certainty that you're going to see these constitutional arguments prior restraint, freedom of association, freedom of speech, um, Rule 210, safe harbor protections. Uh, there's a wide, you know, equal process, rather equal protection, due process, guys violating their rights, guys lying to the court. I think you're going to see these come up. I think you're going to see these come up in SEC cases. If you don't see them in amicus, you're going to see them in uh, motions to intervene. You're going to see these. You're going to see these arguments. They're going to be happening. And then the courts are going to have to decide. And here's the funny thing. Sometimes you get a judge and it's a good, honest judge. Understand stuff, right? So, for instance, in the Coinbase case, they got Judge Fiella, And Judge Fiella also got a class action lawsuit against Uniswap. And she rejected it and dismissed the case because she was like, no, you know, Uniswap isn't a securities exchange and the founders of Uniswap and the people that designed the software are not supposed to have, you know, you can't pretend that they're an exchange and they owe you some due diligence and all this crap. So she understands automated market makers. She understands Uniswap and that's the judge in the Coinbase case. So, I mean, that's awesome, right? Like she ruled correctly in a class action lawsuit against Coinbase. She's therefore, you know, maybe we'll rule correctly in the Coinbase case. Maybe they'll win on their motion to uh, motion for judgment on the pleadings, just similar to motion dismiss. Um, it, it, it depends on what judge you get and how much due diligence they want to put in. And there, there's a lot of cases out there, right? Like there, you've got the case against the tornado guys. You've got uh, the IRS. I guess that comment period's over, but you've got now the the OFAC treasury comment period regarding trying to make all mixers illegal, which is the dumbest thing ever. Like, you, hey guys, here's the Fourth Amendment. It says you have a right to privacy. Here's the United Nations, uh, uh, you know, human rights thing that everyone like signed off on that we believe that, that these are the rights humans should have and privacy is one of them. Freedom of movement is one of them too. But then you go make all these laws that are the opposite of it. You can't say that people have a right to privacy and then do everything you can to violate their privacy. It's not consistent. It doesn't make sense. You're violating the constitution. Please stop. And they're just doing it all over the place. And people aren't fighting back. Like <laughs> you can't have a functioning, human beings are not designed to operate well in non-private environments. That's why we wear clothes. That's why we close our blinds. That's why we lock our doors. That's why we don't share our toothbrushes. Like human beings function well when they have privacy. They do not function well without it. And it just, it's crazy to me that these people, if you can call them that, keep trying to violate everybody's rights over and over and over and over and over again. It's enough. Like, please let us be free. Please. The, the founding fathers fought and died for our freedom. Many Americans have fought and died for our freedom. Can we please have our freedom? Pretty please. You guys should go get real jobs producing things that people want, goods and services people want. If you're just removing people's freedom all day, there's a chance you're not helping society. There's a chance you're hurting society. So, unfortunate. All right. So, you lawyers out there, you need to cover your First Amendment, equal protection, free speech, freedom of contract. There's a whole lot of things that you're not using that you're going to wish you'd used when, if, if you have to go to appeal. And it would be nice to have the precedent set. Um, 
What else? Oh, I made like a little list. Let's hit the list. Oh yeah, cryptocurrency is awesome, right? Um, they keep printing money out of thin air. Prices are all-time highs. Crypto solves that, right? Like cryptocurrency is still the best performing asset that has ever existed in the history of mankind. Very cool. It has better uptime. It has better resilience. It has better robustness. It has better durability. It has better price performance. It has better features. Cryptocurrency is awesome. Um... The freedom to transact underlies all other rights. So if you don't have the right to transact with people, which is something that the founding fathers assumed everyone would have, right? They paid people directly. There wasn't all these stupid intermediaries. If you don't have that, you don't have the right, you don't have the freedom of movement if you can't pay for your bus ticket. You don't have the freedom of speech if you can't buy an internet connection or send a letter. You need to be able to transact to use any of your other rights. Without the freedom to transact, you don't have any other rights. Um, man, I covered a lot of stuff on this list. That's good. Oh, the SEC custody and coins. Okay, I'll cover that. So the two things I see on the list that I didn't cover are one, the Securities and Exchange Commission is custodying cryptocurrency right now via their comment section. With 100% certainty, the Securities and Exchange Commission of the United States has received cryptocurrency in the form of, this is by their definition. By my definition, the true, the real one, you cannot even custody cryptocurrency. You can't. It's impossible. But by their definition, the wrong one, knowing the seed words means that you've received an airdrop you have to pay tax on. So I can tell you with 100% certainty that both the Security Exchange Commission and the IRS Treasury have both received seed words that have money in them to Bitcoin, and they've both received time lock Bitcoin. Both. And they've both received the Uniswap code. So they've, they're hosting for public display the Uniswap code for exchanging cryptocurrencies, time-locked Bitcoin, and the seed words to them, and uh, not time-locked Bitcoin, and the seed words to them. And they can't even know what else those seed words control because it's not knowable because of the halting problem, which states that you can't know whether code will eventually halt or not until you eventually run it. And by that same token, you can't know what derivation paths hold private keys which match values on public blockchain networks because you don't know what derivation path is being used and you don't know how far down that derivation path you'd have to go to exhaust all the possibility of keys that might control things. I don't think it's knowable. Therefore, um, their concept of what hosting an exchange is or what requires you to know your customer or what a customer is or what custody is should all be invalidated by proof by absurdity, right? Because if there are stupid rules that they're trying to make made any sense or were true, then they're all guilty and they all have tax right now. So anybody that works at the SEC that read that comment that had those seed words now has dominion and control and should owe tax now, right? By your guys' rules. Well, guys, did you register as a securities exchange? Did you register as a custodian? The SEC is trying to pretend that every cryptocurrency is a... I didn't explain this harshly enough, and I should do that now. The Securities and Exchange Commission is violating their oath by becoming a domestic enemy of the Constitution that they are supposed to fight against. They are becoming a domestic enemy of the Constitution, and they are trying to classify hugging as punching and trying to arrest parents. That's an analogy. They're trying to classify speech as securities. They're trying to classify uh, entering a block and communicating publicly with everyone. If, if it were true, if it's true that you can't trade securities without a securities exchange, then it's also likely true that you can't pay someone to include your speech in a block. 
because the only method by which these networks allow you to include your speech in a block nearly primarily or nearly entirely is by paying a fee to be included in the block in the native currency. Well, they're trying to undo all that. They're trying to make it so that you can't speak because they're trying to pretend that your speech is a security. That's a violation of their oath. That's a violation of the Constitution. That's a violation of your rights. That's a violation of due process. You're not allowed to play pretend. You're not allowed to pretend that hugging is punching and arresting parents. You're not allowed to pretend that speech is a security. Speech is not a security. Speech is speech. You can turn anything into a security if you want to. You can turn a, an orange into a security. You can turn an orange tree into a security. You can turn anything into a security. But that doesn't mean that they are securities. An orange is an orange. It's not a security unless you work really hard to make it so by including an investment contract. So you buying a coin and using that coin to, to purchase speech on a, on a distributed peer-to-peer -peer open source network, that's speech, man. That's as speech as speech gets. So the concept that you're going to de facto ban cryptocurrency around the jurisdiction of the legislative branch is also a violation of the separation of powers doctrine. It's also a violation of the non-delegation doctrine. Google these things. What they're doing is illegal and they should be held personally responsible for it. And they should, they are acting outside of qualified immunity. I might add a lot, some of it might be covered in a qualified immunity. A lot of it shouldn't be, and they should be held personally responsible. And I would like to see someone from every state of the union sue these people for the rights of yours that they're violating. They have addresses and they've got a lot of money and they should be sued for what they're doing. Let the courts decide whether what they did was okay. Avail yourself of your ability to petition the court for your wrongness, the, the, the wrong that's been done to you. Wrongness wasn't the right word. The, the harms that you've suffered. So it's a, uh, it's sad that we live in a world with so little personal responsibility that unelected bureaucrats that have hundreds of millions of dollars that they've received working for people that have received billions of dollars of fines. Goldman Sachs has gotten so many fines, so many, along with so many other giant entities that these scumbags are protecting. They're violating your rights to protect people that want to also violate your rights. It's gross. It's disgusting. It's tragic. There's few things in the world that are trying to return the power to the people as the founding fathers did. Who out there is working for your right to communicate with your fellow man? Who out there is working for your right to be able to save money without it being debased? Who, who out there is working for your right to your freedom to transact, which underpins all the other rights that you're supposed to have? Cryptocurrency is one of the few industries in the world really trying to return power to the people and introduce efficiency into extremely inefficient systems. And it's just, how can Gary Gensler support Bitcoin as though it were an immaculate conception that had a fact pattern that nothing else could ever possibly have? He speaks out of both sides of his mouth. He does everything he can to make sure that the, the ETFs never happen, never passes any rules, doesn't respond to Congress, is being threatened with subpoena by Congress, who is it's supposed to be his overseer, worked for the people that he's supposed to be regulating, and he's now choosing winners and losers in the technology sector, and the winner that he chose sucks. Bitcoin is not supposed to cost $9 to send. It, it, it's supposed to have larger blocks. It's supposed to have more features. Bitcoin sucks, guys. It's not good. It has a lot of liquidity. And some billionaires are buying it. Fabulous. But other than that, it's trash. It's not good software. It doesn't have a good roadmap. It doesn't have good developers. Oh, yeah, Jack that ran, uh, Jack that ran uh, Twitter while censoring people on behalf of the government in violation of the Constitution now funded a pool for, for Bitcoin miners that was censoring uh, JPEG transactions and was designed by an idiot, one of the few blockchain developers to get hacked for his coins. <laughs> what? Why? Jack, you're an idiot. Jack, you're an idiot and your beard looks stupid. I didn't like what you did at Twitter. It was disgusting. And now I don't like what you're doing with your stupid pool. Stop being an idiot. Jack, you're an idiot. You don't have to be an idiot. Let's watch my live streams. I'll educate you. Okay. I'm good at crypto. You're bad at crypto. I'm good at free speech. You're bad at free speech. 
You suck, Jack. You suck. Uh, God, what's his name? Luke Dash Jr. Luke Jr., you suck. You're terrible. Okay? Like, it's just... Ah! Uh, ah! Here's the good news. Pulse Chain's working perfectly. Axe is working perfectly. You've got all the tools you need to make the world a better place. You are the network. You guys, somebody made these bots. Somebody's made some fiat on ramps. Somebody's made lending. Like, good job, guys. Keep being the change that you wish to see in the world. Keep creating. Keep working. Look, I've been in Bitcoin since it was 50 cents. I bought it at 30. It went down to two. My introduction to crypto more or less was 95% drop. <laughs> and now it's 43K. Okay, so I was mining at 50 cents. Now it's $43,000. That's an 86,000X. That's not bad, right? You, there's going to be volatility. There's going to be ups and downs. You have the tools that you need to create great things. You really, really do. You have something better than Bitcoin will ever be. Now, you have something now that is better than Bitcoin will ever be. That's enough, man. That is enough. You have what you need to create greatness. Um, and, and I think you're going to see regulatory clarity coming up. I wouldn't be surprised uh, to see Coinbase win their case. Their their legal filings sound awesome, right? That that uh, that response to the complaint that they wrote was beautiful, really well written, um, worth reading more than once. So those, those guys did a great job. And then you know you, you'll probably see good arguments in the Kraken case. You, you, you're and they've also got a lot of amicus briefs from other people as well. Some are okay. So I think you're going to get regulatory clarity. And I would love to see personal responsibility from individuals acting outside of their qualified immunity to violate your rights. Your right to associate, your right to transact, your right to speak. It's disgusting. And they should be held personally responsible if the courts allow it. Um, and they, you don't know unless you try. You really don't know unless you try. Yeah. So that's it. Merry Christmas, everybody. I hope that this, let's see how long this video was. I hope that this one hour and 22 minute video is enough for you guys out there. I hope you enjoy it. And, uh, you know, look, you're the network. If you want to see something amazing, you need to make it happen. Uh, I, if people are willing to buy coins that are down all the time or, you know, pictures, JPEG coins or whatever, maybe it's more you know, getting the word out that needs to be done. Maybe that's what makes the world a better place. Um, if things are going to get better, you're going to make it better. I believe in you guys. Merry Christmas, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.